On tonight's program, the police in Papua are gaining trust from the community. Life is too short to be unhappy. And COPD, do you know the warning signs of this fatal disease? Kia welcome to Central News. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Hartford Ave in Papua has been the victim of a bad rap for many years now, some jokingly calling it the ghetto. Papua police are aiming to break that stigma and keep an open conversation with the residents. It was more about getting into a, um, a part of the community that uh, maybe we don't always have the greatest um, relationship with in terms of uh, trust and confidence. Um, uh, the Hartford Air area has uh, been a, a high um, state housing type area for a long period of time um, and maybe a, a higher rental area within the Papua community. Um, to be fair, I think it carries a, a fair bit of stigma that is unwarranted and undeserved and um, through some conversations with residents through this project and through a community open day that we're having tomorrow and some early feedback, uh, it's definitely coming through that a lot of it is a, a stigma that we'd like to turn around as well. Um, there's obviously some very good quality um, residents and community minded people within that area and in fact I'd have, have it to say that the majority of those people are. So what we're trying to do is A, turn around that stigma and B, find out if there is any underlying issues in there that um, we as the police and maybe through some other agencies we could bring in to assist in lifting that profile of that area and um, again a feeling of safety and, and things in that area and I'm by no stretch of the imagination saying that it is unsafe. Uh, from my perspective as the officer in charge of that station, um, I do believe strongly that there is a lot of stigma attached to it and um, it's something that I'd like to see turned around. What basically then is the community contact centre? What are we doing? Um, so through the Hartford Ave uh, support centre, uh, what we're doing is we're just putting a staff member in there at the moment um, on a Friday uh, from between one and three. It's really just a drop-in centre and an opportunity for the community to come to us with any issues that they might not normally want to take to the police station. So we're not aiming for it as a crime reporting opportunity. There's still a mechanism for the, through that through the police station, which is not overly too far away from that location. But it, like I said, it's an opportunity for people to come in and discuss with us some issues that they may have within the community. Maybe they've just got some queries that they wonder whether or not we can give them any form of advice or guidance um, as to people that they could talk to. Uh, and also just to open up a, but really it's just to open up a flow of conversation between the police. We also utilise it to go for a walk. Um, there's a fantastic community garden set up in the area there, so we can go out and uh, be visible in that area. So it's just providing that opportunity for people to approach us and hopefully to make us appear a little bit more approachable too. You say you're not dealing with criminal offending. Are you then using this as a prevention tool? Absolutely, absolutely. So A, our, having us in that area um, will provide an element of prevention anyway. Uh, also, it's an op certainly an opportunity for us to always provide prevention advice and guidance, particularly uh, under the Prevention First initiative, which um, we're using to go towards the police vision of safer communities together. So this is a huge stepping stone for that. Like I said, some people find and, and will maybe be a little bit nervous about coming to the police with things and maybe wondering whether or not they're wasting our time with that, which seems to be, from my perspective, certainly working within neighbourhood support within uh, an area like Papamoa, uh, where we've got a great, a large neighbourhood support network, that the feedback that I get often is, oh, we didn't want to bother you with that. Whereas, from my perspective as an officer in charge of a station, if I don't know what the issues are within my community or even what somebody might think is relatively minor, I can't deploy staff and resources to that area to help address that issue. So it's that communication really and it's opening up a line of communication and it means that whoever's in there can also deliver prevention advice and messaging at the same time. You say some people have come to you and said, 
I don't want to bother you. What kind of situations are you talking about? Uh, we've uh, just a couple off the top of my head. I, I, I assisted a uh, a couple. Um, they were looking for. They had a deceased relative's estate that they were trying to sort, and there was an estranged brother from that family, and they were just sort of wondered whether or not I could assist them with maybe finding out or sending them down some lines of inquiry as to how they could possibly establish the location of their brother. Um, so I was able to initially tell them that yes, that person was still alive for starters as far as we were aware, and give them some lines of inquiry through other agencies that they could go to that they may be able to locate that person's location so that they can at least send them some letters or advise them of the family situation. So that was one thing. Another thing we've done is um, I've had another gentleman come in, had problems with a warrant of fitness, uh, he got sent away um, through his work and the place that he'd initially got his warrant of fitness from, it shut down so he wasn't able to meet his 14 day um, uh, diversion, I'm going to use diversion, it's the wrong term at the moment, but he wasn't able to meet the compliance, he wasn't able to meet that 14 day compliance, so I was able to assist him with what he needed to do to provide to the police or to, um, in order to uh, not possibly have to pay that infringement, because he'd done everything that he could, it wasn't his fault that this place had shut down and he now had to go to somewhere else, so that sort of thing, we're able, to, and normally they may just write it off, but you know, we were able to give them some advice. So, can you give us a couple more examples of how you feel the centre has benefited the community? Uh, the other two that I've dealt with, but um, I, I know that others have come in um, with some security advice. I know that people have come in uh, wishing to discuss fencing issues or neighbourly issues that border on the um, what would probably be a civil dispute but we're able to give them advice as to where to go and what line to take and the people to talk to. So that's the sort of thing that we can do. And then obviously if we pick up on some criminal offending along the way there too, we can, and when I say we're not investigating, it's not for reporting crime, if we identify that there is an offence or something in there, we'll definitely follow that up and go through that line as well. It begs the question, is Hartford have really that bad? No, no it's not. Um, I would walk my family down Hartford Avenue, I certainly don't have any issue with it. The beautiful feedback, what we're doing tomorrow is we are having a community day um, down there and we are going around and canvassing the area, um, asking people if there are any issues that they have within the area, um, asking them if there's anything that we can, as the police could better do to assist them in that area and to gauge, really to gauge an accurate feeling of the area. Um, we've worked closely with uh, various other agencies, so Mental Health Housing New Zealand, um, WINS, um, just gathering a bit of a profile on the area, and that's by no means labelling people, but just having an understanding. Um, and what we did us, or earlier was we've sent out a letterbox drop already two weeks, a week, and, week or so ago, advising residents of that's what we're intending to do and our reason for coming into the area. And from that, I've already had some very positive feedback from people who have rung me direct and said, look, we're not around, we're working during that day. I've asked them if they're prepared for me to just ask them some questions. They've given me their time over the phone and overwhelmingly so far from those people, so they've got absolutely no issue. They love the area, they love the location, they feel safe. Um, so hopefully from us doing this, we might identify a few minor issues that we can deal with. Um, and some family people may come to us and say, hey, look, we are having issues with a family member or something within the family we can give them advice on. And also, we can feed back that it isn't a, uh, a bad area and that the, that stigma that maybe is sort of sitting over there in some, some ways can change. The contact centre will be manned by police on Friday afternoons between 1pm to 3pm. To make a scheduled appointment, phone the Papamoa Police Station on 07 572 2440. But appointments are not a must. Coming up after the break, an inspirational young woman. Welcome back to Central News. Natasha Cox is just 17 years of age, but has a mindset that maybe we could all learn from. Life is too short to be unhappy.
The Bethlehem College student is currently fundraising to get to Ecuador, where she will volunteer with children. Well, I think at the beginning of this year, I decided that I wanted to take a year off before university um, to really do what makes me happy instead of having to put that aside for studies. And so I went along to Latitude Global Volunteering's information evening and I'd seen a pamphlet at my school and as soon as I was in the meeting I knew it was for me. There was a girl sharing about her experiences in Vietnam and it was, it was just incredible and it just, you know, it made sense to me, it's what I wanted to do. So originally I signed up to go to India to go volunteer um, in a disabled institution for children in Varanasi. Um, but because of difficulties with visas, um, I changed to Ecuador. Um, and it's really about, I love making people happy and I love serving other people and doing what I can for others. And I think it was just about combining my love for traveling and wanting to help people. And that had, what Latitude offered just was the perfect fit. So why Ecuador of all places? Well, like I said, it wasn't the original plan, but um, after you know realizing that I needed to make another choice, I I was looking through the brochure, and it first of all looks beautiful as a country, um, but second of all, the, the the language especially, I wanted to be able to pick up a language and be proficient at a language and out already learning French at school, um, Spanish, going to a Spanish speaking country where I could be immersed in the language just, it seemed like an awesome opportunity. So it, it just seemed like a, a trifecta, being able to travel to a beautiful place, help incredible people and learn the language, so. So do you know what kind of work you're actually gonna be doing there? We haven't been informed of our official placements yet, but I'll be working in a schools or caring placement. So. The awesome thing about the Ecuadorian placement is that you have the opportunity to work in a school teaching English or just helping with the children in the mornings and then work with street children in the afternoon. Um, as well as that, I could be working in care placements with children with physical disabilities, learning disabilities, and also the street children, um, the outreach program for them. So um, a really wide opportunity um, and the opportunity to do more, more than one of those. but ultimately just working with children that you know need a little bit of love or need a little bit of you know t schools that need help or teachers that need a little bit of extra help or um, really I'm not I'm not too phased about my exact placement um, I know I'll be able to make a child smile wherever I go and I think that's my aim. Working with troubled children might be quite difficult are you nervous about that? I guess any placement would come with its own challenges or dif um, difficulties. Um, and I guess there is that, you know, that barrier often between a child that's whether physically disabled. But I think being able to see the beauty in everyone and knowing that no matter if you are or you aren't, we're all worth the same thing. And I think treating them with that, with that respect, um, as well as that often I'm guessing that the, the street children are going to be quite troubled, um, probably from very low socioeconomic backgrounds, and being able to work with them, especially as a girl and especially as a young girl, um, I think it's all about just showing them the love and respect that you want to receive from them. And um, like Latitude keeps telling us, when we're, we're not students anymore, we're actually part of the staff. And um, But I think it's... It's showing the respect to them and hoping that they'll show it back. And I think, yeah, showing them unconditional love. And I think if you do that, you'll earn their respect. So you're nervous about anything else to do with the trip? Um, not, not so as much, not so much nervous. I've done, I've been really blessed to have done quite a bit of traveling and, and seen how other cultures work and went on a missions trip with my school this year to Tonga and stay with a local family. So immersing myself in another culture, it, it's exciting and while it's hard at times, it, the, the benefits far outweigh any negatives. But I think one thing I'm most excited about would be the fact that I get to stay with a local family in Ecuador as well. 
and building that relationship. Um, you know, I still talk to my family in Tonga. I still call my mum, my Tongan mum, and the, the children, my brothers and sisters, because even in a, in a two week time frame, you know, you create a bond with people. And I think uh, nervous and excited to see the family that I get to stay with and the opportunities that I, I get through them. You say you want to take the message of self-worth. How do you teach that? Well, I've personally been through a lot with um, um, of troubles with self-worth, so um, eating disorders and and finding my way through that with you know help from friends and my church and my youth group and my faith. And I think being able to come out of that stronger than you were before. Um, and having the attitude that I didn't go through it for no reason and I want um, I want to share what I learned. And even if it's not that extreme, even if those issues aren't relevant to the children over there, I think, I think this world, wherever you are, is in need of some love, some unconditional love. And I think it's about showing these kids that, you know, whether they don't get it at home, that there's someone out there that cares about them and that they're worth more than they think they are. They are. And I think, not so much, it might not, might not be in front of a classroom, you know, teaching them what I went through or sharing my story, but I think, like I said before, treating them like they're precious and like someone loves them. I think, I think that's priceless to a child, especially growing up, because that's when things like problems with self-worth um, really come into play and you don't, maybe won't see the, the, um, the problems that arise from that until later on in life. But I think, you know, if a child knows when they're young that they're worth something at some, and that someone loves them, then I don't think, you know, I think we can help to really eradicate those kind of problems in, in older youth. You have a passion for bringing happiness to people's lives. What drives that? Um, I don't know. I think maybe my faith in... Um, I'm a happy person and I, I strive to stay positive and I strive to, you know, see the light in, the, in things and the happiness in things. And I think I want other people to share in that joy that I feel. And, you know, there's no point going through life being sad or with a frown on your face. And I think people look a lot more beautiful when they smile and I want you know, I want to share that with people and I want to contribute in bringing that happiness to people and sharing in their happiness. And I think when you do that, you instantly make yourself happier and you're in a, you're in a happier place. And I, yeah, I think I just, I love serving people and I love giving things to people, even if it's just a smile, even if it's just, you know, a hello to a stranger or a hug to someone who may need it. And I think Happiness, I think we underestimate how easy it is to bring, how easy it is to give, and how easy it is to make someone's day. Truly inspirational young lady. If you'd like to help Natasha, you can visit givealittle.co.nz forward slash cause forward slash Natasha's passion. Just ahead, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Welcome back to Central News. Last Wednesday was COPD Awareness Day. I caught up with a Bay doctor passionate about increasing the awareness of the fatal disease that affects one in 10 Kiwis. COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease and it's an irreversible lung condition where the lungs are damaged and they, it, it leads to breathlessness and it's a progressive condition uh, that's usually caused by smoking in most cases. So is this a form of asthma? Asthma and COPD can cause very similar symptoms, but they are caused by very different uh, pathology. So no, they're not the same, but patients can experience pretty similar conditions. And to be fair, asthmatics who smoke are likely to develop COPD as well. So are most asthmatic, uh, asthmatics more at risk? No, I don't think that would be fair. An asthmatic who doesn't smoke shouldn't develop COPD. And how common is COPD? I mean there are a particular group who are more at risk, aside from asthma. It, it's a very common condition. In New Zealand the data suggests that at 45 or over 15% of people have COPD. 
Um, that represents over 200,000 people. Um, so it is common and it's particularly common in smokers. Are there any other risk factors? Certainly if you smoke cannabis or you've been exposed to a lot of uh, occupational dust and fumes that have damaged the lung tissue, that increases the risk for COPD and the rates are certainly higher in Māori uh, people groups as well. So what's actually happening inside the body to the lungs when we get this disease? The term obstructive in the COPD title uh, says that the lungs, the tubes in the lungs become blocked, they become obstructed so when you breathe out the airflow should be smooth and even but in somebody with COPD the lungs just collapse down because they lose their architecture, their structure and there's too much mucus and so they can't get rid of all of the air in their lungs efficiently and it leaves, leads to inefficient breathing technique and, and breathlessness. So do they basically wander around with old stale air in their lungs? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Air that is not well oxygenated and therefore they're not getting enough oxygen into their body organs and tissues and they, they suffer the, the symptoms, the consequences of that. So can, can it be fatal or is it kind of a manageable condition? COPD is irreversible. It's a, it is a terminal condition. Once you've got it, you've got it and it's progressive. It gets worse as you get older and certainly a number of people will die because of their COPD from complications such as pneumonia. But having said that, if it's diagnosed and intervention uh, is, is provided early, it can be well managed and, and patients can lead a pretty normal life. But the key is catching it early. What symptoms should we look for then? Well, the cardinal symptom is breathlessness. Um, particularly on exertion, um, with, with doing physical activity, getting out of breath too easily. Uh, and then with all the mucus that's produced and not um, moved from the lungs well, um, a, a chronic cough uh, can be present. Uh, quite early on the, 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 the key symptoms can be just a, a, an early morning cough and breathlessness as you get going for the day, trying to clear all this mucus from the lungs. And then for patients who have more advanced disease, they get the complications of, of, uh, of anxiety from not being able to breathe properly. Uh, depression is quite common, poor appetite and poor nutrition as a result too. These are all symptoms uh, of COPD. Fatigue can be a very common issue too because clearly you're not getting enough oxygen into the body, you're tired as a result. If you are worried, you can ask your GP for a spirometry test. Now for our weather for Tuesday. That is Central News for today. If you have something you'd like to share with us, you can via our Facebook page, centralnews.tv, or email us, news at tvcentral.co.nz. Coming up on tomorrow night's show, all you need to know about the new breath alcohol limit. And of course, White Ribbon Day. Until then, I'm Hilary Entwistle. I hope you have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.